All right, thank you for joining me here. This is my presentation um, for same-sex marriage and social conformity. So first, let me introduce myself. My name is Brandon Lara. I am a student at the Western New Mexico University. So let's go ahead and get into it, right? Social reform is a difficult progression that we struggle with and have struggled with throughout history especially regarding same-sex marriage and equality. We must analyze historical social conforms to identify how we can develop a more equal society today and going forward. Analyzing the social conforms of these five literary works, Incident, Battle Royale, or Battle Royal, Young Goodman Brown, The Lottery, and Antigone will help to understand how we can progress from archaic mentalities to a, div a diverse and innovative future. So, social conform history. Well, I mean, let's think about it. Shouldn't we have a safe society? Really? Think about it. So we gained our independence from Britain between July 2nd and July 4th of 1776. On December 18, 1865, the 13th Amendment abolished slavery formally in the United States and all of the territories. And then again, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 abolished segregation and public discrimination. So why are we still struggling with issues like same-sex marriage? Well, same-sex marriage has had uh, kind of a a crazier history. In fact, just recently in 2015, in the case of uh, Aubergeville versus Hodges, a federal judge legalized same-sex marriage in all 50 states and territories. And based on statistics from the Pew Research Center, approximately 79% of people unaffiliated with religion approve of same-sex marriage whereas 29% of white evangelists approve, which definitely shows a correlation between approval and religion. So in Alabama, just recently, Republicans voted to eliminate marriage licenses so that bigot judges don't have to issue them to same-sex same marriages. So the first the first literary work that I'm going to go ahead and quickly anal uh, analyze is um, was written by the poet County Cullen, published in 1925, named The Incident. So the narrator is an eight-year-old African-American boy who is traveling on the uh, local uh, commute train, and he, exp he encounters an experience with a young white boy, um, who is about the same age, um, who is the one who introduced him to the evils of racism. So um, the narrator says that the boy was not much bigger than him, about the same age, and uh, so he gave him a quick smile. And in response... The white boy stuck out his tongue and called him the N-word. And it was in this moment that he lost his relative innocence from, from, the, world of, from the evil that, that exists in our world. And the next quote reads, Of all the things that happened there, that's all that I remember. So of all the things he did traveling the city of Baltimore... That's what he remembers, is being called the N-word by another young boy. Now let's think about it. We're not born hateful or angry. No, we are taught these ideologies. So for this young boy, this young white boy, to, uh, to express the hatred towards this young African-American boy simply because of the color of his skin... It, it, it introduced this young man into uh, the world of evil and how how these um, uh, these philo these ideologies can harm others. 
So the next literary work was uh, written by author Ralph Ellison and published in 1952, part of his book Invisible Man, uh, about 12 years before the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So this is a crazy roller coaster of a story. Uh, so there are quite a few antagonists in the story. The first and probably one of the most important um, was introduced in the beginning and then again influenced in the end. Uh, so the, his grandfather being one of the uh, antagonists because as he was dying, he gave some, uh, he delivered some just horrifying uh, words to, to his family as he was dying. And may and it scarred the uh, the narrator for his entire life, and it made him feel bad about all that he was accomplishing, all of his success throughout his childhood, you know, all of graduating from school was one of the things. And uh, in fact, that's that's where the story follows next. Is he graduates, and at the ceremony, he delivers an oration that the crowd just loved. In fact, the superintendent uh, appreciated it so much, he decided to invite the narrator to a closed door gathering with all of the community's elite white um, figures, uh, which is why the, uh, the community's white elites are um, some of the antagonists in, in the, uh, the storyline as well. Uh, but when he gets there, he learns quickly <laughs> that he's not just there to deliver an oration to, uh, to the successful men of the community. He's there to partake in a battle royal, hence the name battle royal, with uh, another group of African-American men who are all blindfolded and thrown into a boxing ring and are forced to fight one another in a gruesome, bloody brawl. Um, while being uh, taunted, while being harassed, while being ass verbally assaulted by the by the the audience, and some of them even assaulting the young men, um, they and they even later uh, made them uh, gravel on the ground on a, on a on an electric rug with uh, uh, coins on it as payment to them for their show. Um, but as, as he was leaving, he was brought back in so that he could deliver his oration just, just as he was brought to do. <clears throat> and while delivering the speech, he was being heckled by the audience, he was being ignored, he was being interrupted, and he accidentally spoke out about equality. Which the whole um, room just went completely dead silent, and he was indirectly threatened by one of the uh, audience members. Um, but following his uh, uh, delivery, they gave him a gift of a professional um, leather briefcase with a letter inside and a scholarship inside of it. Um, and he was so happy. He just he felt like these white elites were accepting him as an equal to them, uh, to their social class, which is what the narrator has been trying to accomplish the entire story, which is why he himself is another major antagonist outside of being the protagonist. Um, and so when he got back home, he decided he was going to read the letter. Um, you know, and it was, it was because of the memory of his grandfather that influenced him to open up the briefcase and break the seal on the letter just to read what it says on the inside. And the letter reads as follows. To whom it may concern, keep this in boy running. I decided to uh, censor uh, myself to be sensitive on the subject. But this is, this is a clear indicator of... of a time of American of U.S. history, where um, where very few people were willing to conform to new social ideologies such as equality among men, among 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 humanity. 
That's really what it comes down to. The next literary work is Young Goodman Brown. It's written by 19th century American novelist Nathaniel Hawthorne, published in 1846. And during this time, witchcraft was very popular. And a lot of scholars believe that a lot of uh, practitioners were, um, were also uh, uh, believers of paganism. So a lot of them were pagans. So this story takes place uh, mostly in the forest at the edge of the town's limits. And so the way it starts out is young Goodman Brown is uh, venturing out on a quest to try to uh, convert some of these people who are taking, um, who are participating in this, um, in this witch ceremonial gathering. And so he, he bids his wife Faith farewell as he ventures on his, you know, on his journey. Um, and then he comes to his, uh, his companion who he travels with, um, whom they allude to being the devil. And throughout the entire uh, travel with this companion, he is trying to tempt Brown with various um, offerings of help, just simple help, just trying to, uh, you know, persuade him to join, you know, the other side. Uh, and on their, on, their, on their venture, he comes across many of the villagers whom he encounters with daily in his, you know, in, in life, in, in religion, you know, at church, um, people he grew up with, friends, um, people he was close with. And throughout the throughout the whole adventure, he uh, becomes fatigued and and exhausted um, from carrying the weight of what, what's transpiring. Um, until he decides he's he's gonna go ahead and fight back against against evil, and he 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 thinks he's gonna stand up and just and just you know uh, obliterate them, I presume. Um, uh, towards the end of the story, he comes. It comes to the uh, uh, the ceremony where his where he finds his wife Faith uh, becoming involved, and um, he cries out to to refuse and and, and deny what they're trying to do to her. Um, just before he wakes up and realizes that he was asleep in the forest, and he stumbles back into the into the town. Um, where he comes into contact with many of the people that he saw on his on his adventure the night before, and he can't really de he can't really determine what's reality and what uh, what was a, a dream a vision, um, and because of that he just grew bitter and alienated himself and. And developed a life of solitude and confinement, and he thought he was better than everybody. He thought everybody was just nothing. And because of that, he grew lonely and lived a life of, of basic misery. Um, and which is why the next quote I'm going to go ahead and read. I feel like uh, uh, delivers just that so it reads he had lived long and was born to his grave a hoary corpse followed by faith an aged woman and children and grandchildren a goodly procession besides neighbors not a few they carved no hopeful verse upon his tombstone for his dying hour was gloom and i believe that's because he thought he was better than everybody he was just a bitter man who who couldn't conform to reality over um, this? I uh, I think he went crazy. I think he just you know went through a a, a case of you know psych, uh, just a psychotic episode, and you can't tell what is reality and what is not. 
So the next literary work is The Lottery, written by novelist Shirley Jackson, published on June 26, 1948. Uh, so the best, um, best way to put this into perspective is that it's the movie The Hunger Games is based off of the same concept uh, that the book is written, or that, that the, the story is written. So the lottery, as we understand today, is is a game of chance. You know, it's a gamble. We're gambling to win millions of dollars, to become filthy rich, at at very you know <laughs> um, highly unlikely odds, um, which which is exactly you know pretty for the most part what what the 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 story um, goes along with. So essentially, what happens is. All of the all of the townsmen, they meet annually um, to draw slips of paper to, uh, based on a tradition that they've been that's been you know in place for for many years. And what happens is they they draw slips and it comes down to a family and then the family draws individual slips to determine who of the family is uh, or or whoever pulls the winning ticket. Um, and then the one who who pulls the ticket is then uh, condemned to be stoned to death by the people of the village. And it's based on a convoluted concept that this that this sacrifice is going to just result in economic. Um, prosperity they're they're going to uh they're going to benefit from this you know it's gonna it's gonna help them grow as an economy as as you know it's gonna make them prosper and so forth which is why um, i'm gonna read the next couple of quotes um it, it speaks to how they could not conform to a, a separate ideology in the wake of what this tradition is doing to people how it's how it's gruesomely sacrificing people for no reason so mr adam said to old man warner over in the next village they're talking of giving up the lottery old man warner responded pack of crazy fools listening to the young folks nothing's good enough for them next thing you know They'll be wanting to go back to living in caves. Nobody work anymore. Live that way for a while. Used to be a saying about lottery in June, corn be heavy soon. First thing you know, we'd all be eating stewed chickweed and acorns. There's always been a lottery. And the reason why I think this quote holds so much precedence is that in the end of the story, the lady who pulled the ticket was then of course stoned to death by everybody in the village even the ones who expressed some uh, uh some you know uh, who who questioned the whole tradition of you know and, and felt i guess apprehensive to continue the tradition uh, but nonetheless everybody everybody joined in everybody performed their duty everybody did exactly what they were supposed to do and over time the tradition had grown and, and lost some of its components and the one thing that they that they were able to continue was the stoning and it just it, it goes to prove how you can affect people so negatively that it even comes down to a matter of life and death when you're not willing to conform to a progressive social uh, uh, future. So the final literary work was written by the ancient Greek playwright Sophocles. Um, uh, and t the, the, the playwright is Antigone, uh, which was written in the 5th century BCE and was first performed around 442 BCE. And so what happens, um, the sister of these two brothers um, who happened to have warred with one another. Um, they, they, they both warred with one another because uh, they got into a quarrel and uh, the brother Eteocles, or 
uh, yes, uh, Ateocles uh, banished his brother uh, Polynices to you know live away from the city. <clears throat> banished him away, could never come back, and instead Polynices came back and uh, and you know had an uprising against his brother. But in the end, they both killed one another. Um, the uprising failed. And the uncle Creon was the current leader. And so Creon permitted for Eteocles to have a righteous burial. But he outlawed Polynesis from um, receiving his right to burial. And because of this, the sister Antigone did not conform to her, uh, the uncle's um, law she broke the law she she was planning to break the law she wanted to bury her brother she wanted to bury him next to next to their family she wanted them to be together <clears throat> and because of this creon condemned her to death for for disobeying his law um however creon's son hymen or Haman, uh he loved antigone he was betrothed to her um and, and following her, her demise, he tried to kill his father, um, and, but did not succeed, and instead uh, uh, drove his sword through his own side, killing himself. And because of this, um, Creon's wife also uh, committed suicide in the wake of her son's uh, death. Um, and all of this transpired while other characters in the story were trying to warn Creon of, 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 of his error, of his erroneous decision to condemn this woman to death. Um, they tried to persuade him to be to lead a, as a merciful, um, authoritative leader of the people. But he was too proud. He let his pride get in the way, and because of that, he lost his family. He, he could not conform to a completely separate ideology um, uh, due to his arrogance and his pride. And for that, he condemned himself to a life of misery. Uh, which is why the next quote, uh, when Creon acknowledges his flaws, um, he states, Lead me away. I have been rash and foolish. I have killed my own son and my wife. I look for comfort, but comfort lies here dead. Whatever my hands have touched has come to nothing. Fate has brought all my pride to a thought of dust. And the reason why this is important is because his, his lack of ability to conform led his family to just destruction and calamity. Uh, which is why I conclude all of these literary works possessed similar struggles of conforming to new ideologies. When their customs were challenged, most of them displayed catastrophes of life regarding innocence, betrayals, injustices, and embodiments. There will always be calamity when there is offensive action for rebellions. Today, many people are subject to suffering because of restraints to conform to new social ideologies. Same-sex marriages, as well as other forms of bigotries, are being targeted daily for their differing philosophies. We must learn from our historical past to plan for a safer and more unified society. Yes, we are all different, despite many similarities, but we are all equal. We cannot progress if we are not willing to fight regression. Innovation comes at a price of change. And change is the price for peace. Thank you.